back and those that have been here before today uh, we welcome you uh, back to our six o'clock uh, worship service uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time or if you're visiting it's always a pleasure to have you and we want you to know that the doors of this building roll back on welcome hinges you are our honored guest we invite you to come again uh, to become a part of us and to be part of the Church of Christ, we uh, always encourage you to uh, look at our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and subscribe. And if you want to know more information, you can contact us through our, our website. You know, uh, today was interesting for me, you know, uh, at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, uh, standing at the door and listening to Brother Glasgow and Brother Drain uh, use surgical precision and, and teaching the Word of God and you know and both of them are you know I guess I can say both of them are, uh, have their doctorate degree and so it's, it's just interesting to, to, to follow them you know and so so I was like shaking off nerves all day I said this is a predicament to be in you know <laughs> and so I, I always I always uh, enjoy uh, his teaching and Brother Drain has been knowing him for many, many years. So uh, they, it's uh, interesting just listen to their approach uh, to the Bible and how, how they explain things and, and to keep you, uh, uh, keep you uh, paying attention. So that, that, was, that was interesting for me. I was sweating bullets going home. I was just shaking my head. I said, oh, man. <laughs> so we enjoyed that. Last week, we were uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the, the, the Adam, the second Adam, the first Adam. And, uh, you know, this morning, Brother uh, Glasgow was talking about prove all things according to the word of God. And it, we've had, been looking at that subject in detail for uh, a couple of weeks. And, and uh, it, it's interesting when you listen to it, just all plainly laid out. And then Brother Drain would say uh, the wisdom, uh, the teaching from a wise man, I believe. He talked about Abraham in the book of Genesis. And so, so continuing with that idea of what working from the Old Testament, uh, just uh, talk a few things about Genesis. Uh, Genesis, that is, is the uh, is the that is the creation or the generation uh, being the name given to it in the Septuagint, as does that designated its character because it gives us an account of the of the origin of all things. It contains, according to the usual confrontation, the history of about 2,369 years. Genesis is divided into two uh, principal parts. The first part from Genesis chapter 1 and, uh, to chapter 11 gives us a general history of mankind down to the time of the dispersion. The second part presents the early history of Israel to the death of Joseph in chapter 50. Then the death of Joseph, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24, and Joseph said to his brethren, I, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. So there are five principal persons brought in succession on our notice in this book. And around these persons, a history of the successive uh, period gr is grouped. A Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and ja Jacob. Let us do for our reading this evening in, uh, in Psalms chapter 114. If you will turn to Psalm 114. Psalm 114. Talking about the presence of the Lord, the power of God in his deliverance of Israel. It said, when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah was his sanctuary. 
and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ails thee, O thou sea, that thou fleest, thou Jordan, that thou was driven back? Ye mountains that ye skip like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. Tremor thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing, standing water, the flint into a fountain of water. So we have chosen... So looking at that idea of God in, 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 uh, in, in the Bible, uh, in uh, Psalms chapter 114, every day, every single day, I think now for the last two years, I ask myself the question of how, it, how can we uh, as a church or as a family even, how can we uh, move forward in, in, in this area, in this country. You know, we've been here for almost two years dealing with the, this coronavirus, this pandemic. And, and I think even when I'm talking to different people in the congregation and people in the community, everyone, it seemed like they're just tired of, of, of this pandemic. And so I was asking myself a question, how do we develop a path forward? How do we move from where we are here today and move into the future? How do we get out and how do we, we move forward? So I chose as a topic, Exodus, the path forward. You know, this is just for me, for my thinking, my, how my brain works is I say, looking at the book of Exodus and then thinking about how do we create a path forward from where we are. And you know, uh, in all cases, in the Bible, as we're going to see, that, that, that there, there, there is never any going back. And sometimes we'll ask ourselves, say, you know, I, I wish we could go back to the way things were. I, I wish I, I remember how things used to be uh, before the pandemic, when we were all happy and we assembled together and we had the kids around and summer series and so forth and so on. And we asked ourselves, well, you know, we want to go back. But there's not a case in the Bible of going back. It, it, it's always forward. And you know, if we did go back, if we were to go back for two years, we would find out there are people that, that, that are not there anymore. We have lost quite a few people over this pandemic, some from COVID and some from non-COVID related, but we have lost them. So they're gone. If we look, we have kids that have actually grown up and become adults and went off to college. They will never be here anymore. We have some that their medical conditions have progressed where they would not be able to assemble with us anymore. And then we have those that simply have gone away and went away and fallen away that would never come back. So we can't, there's no going back. We would like to go back, but we need to burn the idea of going back and ask ourselves, how can we develop a path to go forward? If we are to please God, we must follow his path forward, not our path. But what is it that God wants us to do? And sometimes we, we look at congregation, they're developing all different types of forms of activities and entertainment or attainment or what you want to call it. We don't need entertainment in the church. Entertainment is filling the whole world. We can get entertainment anywhere we want. But in the church, if we're going to go forward, we're going to have to preach the word of God. We're going to have to teach the word of God. We're going to have to baptize people into Jesus Christ and continue to teach them. If we look at Adam, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there was no going back. God put them out. He put a flaming sword around the garden and they could not go back. Adam had to develop a path to go forward. He had to deal with the ground and the thorns and the thistle and the sweat of his brow. But there was no going back for Adam. He was out. And the only way he could do, go was forward. And we know he went forward because what? He had kids and he had more kids. And so we know Adam went forward. When Noah... When God came to Noah and he said, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And God said, well, I found grace in Noah. He told him to build an ark. And when, ark, when Noah boarded that ark and when the rain started to fall and when that boat started to float, excuse me, not the boat, the ark, it was not a boat. When it started to float, when he came and landed on dry land, it was a new world and there was nothing to go back to. There's no going back. With Abraham, God told Abraham, as Brother Drain talked about this morning, he said, get out of your country 
from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. And some of us, we need to get out. But God told Abraham to get out and Abraham, there is no going back, even though Lot went with him, that he should not have been there. And one thing I noticed about the life of Abraham and Lot, every time Abraham got himself in trouble, God still was fulfilling his plan. God still worked it out. And Abraham left each situation better off than when he went into it. But now Lot, when he got himself in trouble, Lot left out a little poor and a little worked out. And when he left out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he left out with the clothes on his back. So we should think about that. There, there's no going back. And then there was Moses. He told Moses, I will now turn aside, Moses said, and I will go and see this great thing. Moses had grown up in Egypt. He had two parents. He had his adopted parents, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. He had his birth mother. And, and, and so I can imagine Pharaoh's daughter training him and all the, the skills of Egypt and how maybe to become Pharaoh one day and his mother's whispering in his ear. He said, you know, we are Hebrews. We serve the God of all creation, the God of A Adam and Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Jacob. We, we serve that God. We, we, God. we serve the God that created all the heavens and earth. We wonder where Moses got his, uh, his ideas from. He got his ideas, if you would, from his mother and not Pharaoh's daughter. So, so Moses said, well, when God says, said, well, when he called him up and he went to see that bush that was burning, that did not burn up, God would say, look, you're going back down to Egypt. And I looked at the distance, I think, between Egypt and uh, Midian, where he ran. And I, I'm not sure if the numbers are right, but they say it was like 6,000 miles. But I'm not sure how that was. But man can travel a lot of distance. And we sometimes we think in our mind, we might not be able to travel that long distance. But they have people now that walk for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 miles. And so, so Moses, I guess he was like Forrest Gump. When he started running from uh, Pharaoh, he just kept going until he came down to Midian. So we should think about that. How do we exodus this pandemic, this coronavirus thing, and we build a path forward? Take a look at this. The chronolog chronology of this sojourning and the very thing. If you were a part of Jacob's family, and you went down into the, uh, uh, Egypt. It says from the descendants of Jacob into Egypt to the death of Joseph was about 71 years. But look at this. From the death of Joseph to the birth of Moses was 278 years. So Moses died. Uh, Jacob died. Joseph died. All of their children died. And so when we talk about here to ch them naming off the children of Israel, when they're getting right, they're not talking to his direct descendants. They're talking to many, many generations of these people later on. I think uh, uh, when they came out of uh, Egypt on this path, they came out, I think, of maybe two or three million people out of seven, a family of 70 folk. So they, they, they greatly multiplied. Uh, so, so look at that. And so if you were the one going down in Egypt, you would not be coming out of Egypt. There was nothing going back. The, from the birth of Moses to the flight into Midian was 40 years. And of course, he returned after 40 years. But from the return of Moses to, to the Exodus was only one year. So God worked a lot of miracles. There was 10 miracles down in Egypt within a period of one a year. So we look at John chapter 12, and verse 24. It got, Jesus Christ says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. I just think about that when I look at uh, Joseph going down into Egypt and when his, all of his 12 sons died and Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh, all these men are dead, but they had their descendants uh, that was there. So they went down and died, but they came out uh, much more. Moving on in Exodus chapter uh, uh, 1 and verse 7, it says, But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Don't you think that's what God wants us to do as a church? When he tells us to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, when you look at the cases in the book of Acts, when you look at the examples where the word of God was preached, when they went out and taught the gospel of Jesus Christ, when they spoke unto them about Jesus Christ, in every single case, they grew and they multiplied. So we want to know how to go forward. We preach the word of God. And then we let those things, let it multiply. Look at what God told Abraham. 
He said, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. In Genesis 22 and verse 17. And then God spoke to Isaac in Genesis chapter 29. He says, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give you Give your offspring as all these land. He said basically the same thing to Jacob. And I and God said to him, I am God almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come from you. So God said, well, the message essentially did not change from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. And when we look at the preaching of the gospel from the day of Pentecost until the events that took place on Solomon Porch and, and when Philip went down uh, to, to Samaria, and when we look at any case in, in, in the Bible, the message does not change. It, it remains the same. So we should be what? We should have all things common. When we're preaching the gospel, the message should not change. In Genesis chapter 46 and, and 4, God promised Jacob, I will myself, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So God told that Jacob said, look, I'm with you. I will be with you. And now listen to the words of Exodus chapter one, verse seven. After recording the sons of Israel in Exodus one, verses one in the same order. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong to the, from the land that, that was given them. So when we look at this case of what the path forward for me is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The way out of the pandemic is to teach and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guess what? We can grow, we can multiply, and, and one day we will look back and we remember those days when there was this thing called, um, what was that thing called? Uh, COVID something. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Where God calls all of us to forget. So multiplying is what God wants us to do. And then in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, And it came to pass in the course of those many years that the king of Egypt died. So, so, so Moses is gone. God is now still in Egypt working. Said the, king, the Pharaoh died. Why? Because it is uh, 430 years of this going on, of these Pharaohs, if you would. So there, of course there was a case where there was a, a Pharaoh that rose up that did not know Joseph. Most of the people in Israel, the only way they knew old Joseph because the message within the Hebrews did not change. This is, we are Hebrews. We, were, we are served the God that created the heavens and the earth. And they told the story of, Ab of Adam and they tell the story of Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So the message did not change. So the children of Israel always remembered their descendants. That I don't know if Egypt did. I don't know if Egypt did. So it came to pass in those days that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the abundance and they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the abundance and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob and God saw the children of Israel and God took knowledge of them. So the church, we should always, what say, pray without ceasing. We should always be crying unto God. When things are difficult, when things are hard, when things are going well, we should thank God. We should always be crying unto God with our hardship and uh, during our difficult times. Look at Psalms 34 and 17. said the righteous cried out. The unrighteous going about their business. They make false claims about God. But the righteous, it says, cries out. And the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So if something troubling you, if you feel uneasy about what's going on in Ukraine, which way Russia is going and what Putin is going to do, don't worry about it. God has always figured this thing out from the future. So what we need to do in our path, regardless of the circumstances, we should be a help for the church and not a hindrance. We should be working on how do we go forward. Remember what the hymn says, God will take care of you. I oh, remember we used to sing that. It's still in the songbook, I suppose. Be not dismayed, dismayed whatever betides. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Through every day, over all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you.
And we have to, have, we have to be confident in those things. So well, well, I'm not concerned about what the world, is, the, the, what the world state is, the United States or the Georgia. Well, what I'm concerned about is preaching the word of God. Psalm chapter 10, uh, Psalm 107 and verse six, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distress. The children of Israel was down there and Joseph is gone and no one remembered who Joseph was but them. And so they were crying out to God and God, he heard them. God will take care of you. Look at Matthew chapter one and verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He's with us. We must believe that. We have to be sure of that. That what, whatever life brings us, we want to stay close to God and God will be with us. God showed the world his great might as he crippled Egypt with the plague. But what? Pharaoh still did not believe. God was with Israel visibly day and night through a cloud and a pillar of fire. And God was, had light on, on the side with Israel and what? It was wreaking havoc with the Egyptian army. God fought for Israel, defeating Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. God fed the people with manna and quails and provided water in the desert place for them. God gave Israel laws to follow and told them to of the deadly consequences of not keeping his covenant. Israel was truly beloved and cared for by God. God, will deli God delivered Israel and God will deliver us and out of this pandemic and he will set us on a path forward. Pharaoh's first plan failed. The word of God states, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. So what, what can man do to us? He might be able to kill the body, but he cannot kill the soul. We can't, should not let man uh, destroy our spirit and our love for Jesus Christ. We should keep our eyes focused and we should move forward. Here's a great lesson for Christians today. The world tries to oppress us due to our exposing their sins. They don't like it. For some reason, when you're on your job and around people, it's something that's just not there. It's kind of quirky because, they, what, you want to maintain your Christianity and they cannot figure out why you are like you are. Keep your faith in God. The world cannot hate you. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that it, its works are evil. John chapter 7 and verse 7. Let the Christian today gain greater insight of, uh, to our purpose in life when being persecuted for doing that which is right. Let us grow spiritually stronger. The more we are afflicted, let us grow. Let us study. Let us pray. Let us call on God. Let us do those things that are, that, that are good and right in, in the sight of God. Kills the Egyptian boys. The, the story is that when, what, when, when, they, when uh, the, the Hebrews began to grow and multiply, Pharaoh came up with a plan. He said, let's kill all the boys. Let's uh, let the midwives uh, kill them as soon as they are born. But Pharaoh is not done resisting God's plan. He now orders the Hebrew midwives to kill the boys at the birthing stool. The point is to make it look like an accident because the mother generally don't see the baby when it's first born. The woman cannot see as a child is birthed. If the child was a boy, the midwives was to kill the child like by suffocation, making it appear as if the child died or was still birthed. But listen to verse 17. But the midwives, they feared God. God is looking out for what? In all cases, we, we, can, we can't outdo God. We can't maneuver our way around what God wants. We can't outthink and, and we can't plan something different for what God wants, God will get. The question is, will you get what you want? But God, when someone asked me, he said, well, you, you know, you, you, you work in that and about getting paid. I said, I don't want to get paid. I want a gift. I want the free gift. I want the eternal gift. I don't really thinking about money. If I have money, fine. I've had money. I have without money, but guess what? I want to get, give me a gift. Don't give me money. I want the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift from God. But the midwives they feared the God and did not do as the king had commanded them. Remember what Peter said? 
here is one of the earliest examples of doing what the apostles would later do. We must obey God rather than man. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Put forth that. Look, I, I can't do that. Hold fast to it. Going forward, we must focus on obeying what God says. Psalms chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? And the kings of the earth set, themse set themselves and the rule rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven and shall laugh, the Lord shall hold them in derision. In a most animated and highly po poetical style, the writer in these four stanzas of the uh, three verses each sets forth the end. Uh, this is something I plugged in there that I thought sound well that don't sound very well right now. So it's just the point is that what? <laughs> said, uh, look, God's determination to carry out his purpose that purpose as stated more fully by his son, the esta establishment of the, the kingdom and, and so forth and so on. So, but so, so, so second Timothy chapter three and verse 12. Yes. And all who des desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will not maybe there's a possible chance. It said you will suffer persecution. We don't, we, it's not a choice here. First Thessalonians chapter three and verse three, uh, uh, talking to Timothy, Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to encourage you, your concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, the affliction that they were in, Paul and Timothy and Titus, and the affliction that we might go through today. They were, don't get shaken. Don't get unnerved. Uh, don't, don't lose your composure. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. They were appointed to it. And if you're a Christian, if you live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. We should, we should know that. Why did Pharaoh reject God's commandments, commands even after seeing the power of God? I mean, it, I mean Egypt was torn down to its core. There was nothing left in Egypt. The cattle, the trees, everything was up, but still, Pharaoh you maintained his pride. No one is going to tell me what to do. But he forgot one thing, the God of the Hebrews. So I don't know, why, why was he out of all this power? And sometimes when we're reading our Bibles and we're looking at God and looking at Jesus Christ and looking at the miracles and stuff, we, 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 what? we, we still don't recognize his power and, and, and how he works for us. God had bore them on eagle's wing, caring for, caring for them each step of the way when they came out of, in Exodus 19 and 4 and only asked that they keep his commandments. Is that God, isn't that what Jesus Christ said? If you love me. You keep my commandments. Why all the disobedience? The answer to man's greatest problem is here and found. Sin is an e sin is an even that occur event that occurs in my life and when I do what I want rather than what God wants. That's what sin becomes an event. That what when you do not do what God wants you to do, then it becomes sin, and it's an event in our life. You, my heart is hardened against God at times when my will is set above God's will. When Brother Amos wants to do what Brother Amos wants to do, then what? That's, it's hardened. That's what, isn't that what Pharaoh wanted? Pharaoh said, no, I'm the Pharaoh of Egypt. No one is going to come in here and tell me to let my people go, my servants, the one to do all the work. No one is going to come out and tell me what to do. But he did not know the God of the Hebrews. Though I sin against God, he continues to love me and provides me for my forgiveness. In other words, that regardless of what we do, we can ask for God's forgiveness. He will forget us and he forgive us and he will restore us to his church. In this, this path, if you had no obeyed the gospel, there's a path for you. It's called hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and believing it and repenting and confessing and, and, and being baptized. God has created a path for the Christian and he has created a path for the non-Christian. The author of Hebrews and Hebrews uh, uh, states in Hebrews 3.13. It's not there. Why did Pharaoh reject God's commandment? Why did the Hebrews mumble and complain though they saw God's mighty work? The Hebrews 
saw the same power of God and the same miracles that God did to the Egyptians, they saw it. But still, they were murmuring and complaining. God had bore them on eagle's wings, as we said before. Why, why all the disobedience, as we said? We, we don't know. Sin is an event that we, we talked about. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Don't let it ruin your life. For you are not under the law, but under grace. You, you what? We're for the law of liberty, the one that Jesus Christ gave us. But God be thanks that though you were slaves of sins, or you were slaves in Egypt, yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you become the slaves of righteousness. God set for the, uh, uh, the children of Israel, he set them free. To do what? Take them down to Horeb, to Mount Sinai, so he can introduce himself to them. So he could go down there and he, they, they built a tabernacle. He gave them means of worship in the book of Leviticus. He set everything in place for Israel. And guess what? They were still murmuring and complaining. They saw God on the mountain. It was like, no, we don't want to get close. Mo, Mo, you go up and talk to him. God brought himself and introduced himself. Israel became slaves of Pharaoh. God freed them from Egyptian dominion and set them on a path to the promised land. Where is our promised land? It's in the future. It's out there. It's waiting for us. All we have to do is try to break free of this thing they call coronas. But exhort one another day by day, so long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So what? Every day we should be encouraging one another talking to one another, trying to build one another up, trying to help and assist one another, doing good for one another. And so what? We can all move along as Israel down this path to the future. The book of Exodus moves man to see his sinfulness and that God offers provision for, for those that sin. The di direction of life takes lies, lies in, in your hand. God will, God's will is that I would keep his commandments. Look at Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. Matthew 2 and verse 13. It says, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise. And it talked about what? How, how God told Joseph to take, take uh, Jesus Christ and Mary and take what? Take them to Egypt. And, to, and they stayed there, and then they started to show the, 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 the typology of, of between Moses and Jesus Christ, but we're not going to deal with that right now. So, so it said, while it was called today. So we, we should what? We should, while it's called today, we should try to do that which God wants us to do and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that is, is outlined in the Bible. We heard some exceptional messages today at 9 and 11 o'clock, and I would say, I'm thinking to myself, that's a message that will move me to be baptized again. There, was a, there were good messages. And so we, we have the message. We have the word of God. We have the, the brothers and, uh, uh, that, that support us and we support them. So the only thing we're lacking are the souls of people that will come to hear the word of God. And like Brother Johnson said on Tuesday night, evangelism is all of our responsibilities. You want to grow and multiply? Go and invite. Don't worry about Corona. The, the, the CDC said you can take your mask off now. But you go first. And keep mine on. So, but, but the point is that we can grow on this path forward, we can develop, we can become stronger than we were before, we can come, become more people than we were before, we can teach more, but the opportunity is there for us. So we have one here that wants to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must recognize that the gospel requires us to do certain things. To, to, to hear about Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Jesus, John the Baptist taught baptism. Jesus Christ taught baptism. And John taught it because Jesus told him to come here and teach it. And when what? His apostles, when they went into all the world, they taught baptism. On the day of Pentecost, they baptized and they continued to baptize. And they taught other brothers to do what? Go out and to baptize. And so we can follow that path that are forward. But if you have not obeyed the gospel, and we, we had give you the opportunity to do that. The water is always ready. The baptizer is always ready. All we need is a body to baptize and Jesus Christ will add you to his church. Or we have one in here that have fallen short, that have not been keeping the commands of God. We give you the opportunity to make a confession as we stand and sing the selected hymn. Oh, do, do not, not let the word 
never depart and close thine eyes against the light. <clears throat> Sin, be saved, O oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight?